prochain. Euh, les Français parlent de cœur. Si nous prenons l'exemple en russe, de Marine de Chaboucher, en français, on va dire euh, parler cœur à cœur. Si nous parlons en russe de. Les Français diront plutôt esprit ouvert. Qu'est-ce que j'en ai dit Il y a beaucoup d'expressions de tout qui ne vient pas à l'esprit actuellement. Euh... Bon, bref, je suis désolée, c'est un peu spontané. Euh... On trouve pas parler leur bien d'autres. Et ce que je pense que la spiritualité de russe est beaucoup plus importante dans la transcription de chasse. Il n'est pas dans le camp, il est ailleurs. Euh, pour les Français, le cœur, c'est très important, mais le cœur, c'est quelque chose qui est vital. C'est plus, euh, même, je ne sais pas, on peut dire, biologique. Okay, so for anyone, for the people who don't speak French, she's really arguing that the, she doesn't say it here, the people change when they actually get interviewed uh, and they're a little less trenchant. But she, at the beginning she says, the French will never understand the Russian soul because when we speak of the Ruskaya Dusha, when we speak of Rus Ruskaya Dusha, they speak of the cœur. Oh, sorry. Hi. Can I start? I'm a And then? Where were you born? Um, I was born in Japan. Yes. Yeah, and uh, what was the English teacher? Japanese. And did you read? English. And then? And then you have to speak a lot. Okay. Speak about the heart. Uh, how do you understand the heart in English? How do you understand the heart in Japanese? Ah, ah, how do you learn the language? I know the language. It's difficult because it's completely different. The heart in love or medical wise? You tell me what it is for you. There are no right answers. Okay. Okay, you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. My name is Anne Crane. I actually was born in Surrey, BC, Canada, but I only speak English. Um, I associate the heart, well I need one to be alive, but I associate with love, kindness, empathy, friendliness, um, and I suppose everyone has a heart so we're all connected in some way. I want mine to work for a long time, but I hear that some people don't. <laughs> What about these expressions? Can you translate these expressions into Japanese? Cold hearted. Can you say this in Japanese? Cold hearted. Cold hearted. Cold to touch and then heart. So cold hearted. What's that in Japanese? What's the word cold? Cold, cold? cold means. Yeah. So what's the translation? What's cold and then heart? Really, smitai kokoro. I don't speak Japanese. You're telling me. I, 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 I'm not sure I mean, understand it correctly, but I'm not sure. For me, it's quite a strange question, right? Yes. That's yes. why. Warm-hearted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Open it to cold-hearted, yeah? Why are you asking such a question? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. So this paper is about translating and understanding the heart, but this is not necessarily the heart that I was thinking of when I asked my questions. Uh, I'm a Scottish academic. Here we have an Australian tour guide, an Australian barman. We have a Russian teacher who's been living in France for 30 years, and they all feel slightly different about the heart. But, um, but we all believe it's essential. We all believe it's essential. We all try to translate this single fundamental concept into other languages. What interests me, though, is um, where we encounter problems in translating and understanding. This, uh, the Australian barman taught me something. As an English speaker, this is an important lesson for me. I can, I can perceive of slight differences between the Australians and the New Zealanders. 
But I would never have thought that they consider themselves so different in terms of the way they play sport and in the way they educate boys into becoming men as parts of teams and as patriots. But this is how he perceived his adolescence. As an Australian, he had to fit in. Uh, he had to fit into New Zealand and he had to adopt the national sport. He had to be good at it. He had to be a good team player. This would allow him to assert his adherence to the dominant group. The fact that New Zealand, of course, is a younger brother, a smaller brother to Australia, no doubt accentuates the fact that the peer group pressure uh, that he experienced. He didn't want to be rejected. This meant wholeheartedly adopting New Zealand, its sports, its teams. Hart then is clearly a gender question. For him, Hart is about being a man among men, about courage, personal courage, but about collective endeavours, working together, putting your hearts into the game, into a game that is so much more than a game. So the heart is a gender question and a culture question. The Russian, the Russian teacher was clearly confronted, was daily confronted, every day confronted with the difficulties of translating and educating students in her classes. She contrasted soul and heart, but she wasn't thinking of soul and heart, she was thinking of Ruska, Dusha, and Le Coeur en français. Now the Frontex corpora demonstrates that there's a long-standing tradition, a long-standing connection, interrelation between courage and cœur throughout medieval, renaissance, French literature. But this teacher is not thinking about that. She's thinking more about romance, sensibility, feeling. She recognized these to be fundamental, but she pointed, fundamental, but she pinpointed them as vital, vital. And by vital, she meant belonging to bodily experience. So she stressed in her gestures, which demonstrate her spatial metaphors, how she lives these metaphors, her conceptual metaphors, that the heart is in the body, in the breast, and the soul belongs beyond, in the transcendental sphere. This is debatable, of course. The vast majority of biblical references to the soul do not refer to the mortal soul, but to the mortal soul, nephesh and anima. Invariably, these, uh, these terms invariably refer to the living, breathing animals of creation. But the idea of the soul, the soul, that, the soul that precedes life, the soul that lives on after death, the death of the body, is not only a platonic and a neo-platonic ideal, it's also part of the dogma of Christianity, it's part of the Muslim religion, and it clearly plays an important role in folk theories in Russian, French and English. What's interesting for me though, is the way the lady performed her own conception of the soul, the conception of sheep her conception of the soul and the way she perceived the French as perceiving the heart. Vital, but not transcendental. The French were, she felt, missing out on a dimension of the life of the soul. Now, I'm not judging and I'm not affirming here. I'm simply stressing that it's worth, <coughs> as ethnolinguists, it's worth us listening to someone who struggles to express herself, herself in two different languages over a period of 30 years. What she says about the patterns of thinking and feeling appear to me intriguing, enlightening, and, per and perplexing. Increasingly, as you'll see in the last video, I've tried to interview people together. Why? To see how they confirm and how they detract from what each other says. Even though, huh, there's the expressions. My questions are intended to invite them to think together, and their agreements, their disagreements, and their refinements, their corrections, fascinate me just as much as what they say. Um, all the more so because this demonstrates that speech, speech communities are constantly redefining concepts and generating shared understanding. So if I tell you in English, soul means this, but here I'll show you something, something very, very different. Um, and this negotiation, this negotiation is part of the, this, these agreements, disagreements are part of the everyday, everyday language. Like the Australian tour operator, I have no Japanese. So I cannot judge to what extent it's difficult to translate metaphorical expressions into Japanese uh, from English. But the fact, that, the fact that she's embarrassed, physically embarrassed, and even confounded by the expression such as cold-hearted, does seem to me worthy of note. The fact that she experiences the Japanese concept and the English concept to be very different also appears to me interesting. And the fact that it's an English speaker who affirms that heart is universal seems to me somewhat predictable. 
and not particularly reliable. If we look deeply into the question of what we mean exactly by the heart, Then. This is going to be my plan. Then. I'll look at the video counters that we've seen. I'll consider dictionaries, corporate texts, and questioners, interviews. I'll now go on to the conceptual definition, and then I'll go on to the translation paradox that the heart is easy and very difficult to, to, because to, very difficult to translate. Those difficulties will be related to seven difficulties that are very, very briefly listed. Okay? Um, yeah, I haven't really been respecting my. So what is the heart? And what does it con does it coincide with the other languages I've looked at? Herz in, in German, Kerr in French, Sotze in, in Czech. If the if the heart uh, if the heart exists, then it must exist somewhere. And um, this is something that uh, uh, this is something that people would stress um, that the heart is central, it's fundamental. They would often touch their chest, but at the same time they would often open up their hands to stress the capacity of the heart to open up to the world. The idea of putting their hearts into something was fundamental for many people, especially the Australians I interviewed. Some people opened up their arms to enfold as much space as possible, and they declared that the heart was something fundamental, but was, the heart was vast and all-embracing. Now, the barman's colleague, who we don't have time to look at, but we saw in, in Warsaw, uh, the barman's colleague was a well-traveled young woman. She declared that the heart was everything. <laughs> Friends, family, Australia. <laughs> Others seemed to indicate that the heart referred to a private space, the, the inner self. This French speak of the fort intérieur and the cœur as uh, synonyms in this sense. However, the heart was invariably dynamic. It was expanding. Or it was recentering itself, recentering itself. It was interactive, opening up to others, embracing them, feeling for them. So the five facets of the heart. The wide reading that I've been doing over the last couple of years, the textual analysis, but above all the philosophers and the lexicographers enable us to posit that there are five main dimensions or facets to the to the heart to the heart and to the other, the, to the other uh, three concepts that I've looked at. The coinciding concepts. I think of them as coinciding concepts, not as translingual or transcendental concepts. Coeur, Herz, Serze. The heart is a vital organ, maintaining the body and whose failure means death. The sensitive heart is the second definition, the sensitive heart that feels, the faculty that makes us human or humane, in a variety of folk, folk tales which will oppose men and demons, but also men and animals. The third is facet, or the third aspect, uh, the heart with its desires, its dreams, its lusts, its pleasures. The fourth, the heart can move and combine with other hearts. The heart can offer itself, it can offer itself up, it can attach itself, it can withdraw itself, but, it can, but also win and keep the hearts of others, just as it can spurn or abandon them. <coughs> the fifth dimension, the heart as the second self, the inner self, the true nature, the heart of the intuition that speaks to us. <coughs> this is linked to the intellectual soul, if we look at Aristotle or Aquinas or Augustine. These are... Uh, the, the specific powers of the soul that they speak of, and this is one important part, the intellect, they see this as part of the intellectual soul or the spiritual soul. This second self that can do what? It can it advise us, it reminds us, it reminds us of the fleeting nature of our overpowering desires. And often intuitively, it knows us better than we know ourselves. This is the heart that workaday business, everyday business, tends to drown out. And that's why we're reminded by religious leaders, by religious leaders, poets, uh, but also marketing adverts, uh, also coaches' uh, interest in well-being will remind us to not neglect this heart. The paradox about the heart, then, the paradox about the heart is that the heart turns out to be very, very easy to translate, and some aspects of the heart are very hard to translate. How does this work out? If we look at the, the internet, we'll find lots of examples of 
das Herz zu hören, listen to your heart, écoute le cœur, posso heise sertze. Du hast a... Okay, here. Uh, okay, here. okay, I'll just read these out very, very quickly. Okay, pardon Marco if the pronunciation is not perfect, you'll correct me if my translations are, are faulty. But I, I don't experience any difficulty translating these expressions. Warum ist es so wichtig, auf das Herz zu hören und wie gelingt es, die Stimme des Herzens wahrzunehmen und ihr zu folgen? Kopf oder Herz? Du, so lernst du auf dein Herz zu hören, Gedanken power. Why is it so important to listen to your heart? And how do we manage to perceive? How can we manage to perceive, perceive and follow the heart? Head or heart, listen to your heart, thought power. And I've missed this in the German text, I should have kept it. Should you follow your heart or your head? My heart says yes, my head says no. In French, pourquoi est-il si important d'écouter le cœur et comment parvient-on à percevoir et à suivre la voix du cœur Tête ou cœur, c'est ainsi que vous apprenez à écouter votre cœur, la puissance de la pensée. I'm not experiencing any difficulty uh, dealing with this. Suivre la tête ou le cœur, mon cœur dit oui, ma tête dit non, which seems to be perfectly French. Now we might think this is simply the standardization, standardization of the internet with the constant translation. But if we look to the great texts, if we look to the Bible, it's almost systematic that the curve will be in level to different translations uh, uh, from various uh, French translations. And the curve is usually translated by heart, in Hertz, um, and I'm not experiencing any problem here. So if we go back to Esau, and uh, this is from Esau and Jacob, Esau is jealous of his brother and he decides to kill him. If we move from the King James Bible, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him, and Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, and I will slay my brother Jacob. Und Esau war Jakob Gram, und des Segens willen mit ihm den sein Vater gesegnet hat, und sprach in seinem Herzen. Okay, and the word he uses uh, Würgen, sometimes it's translated in this Bible as uh, Umbringen. Esso conçu une haine contre Jacob à cause de la bénédiction dont son père l'avait béni et a essu à diser dans son cœur. Le jour de deuil de mon père vont approcher et je tuerai Jacob, mon frère. So, for me as an ethnolinguist, used to the difficulty of concepts and the difficulty of translating, it's terribly perplexing to see how easy this translates. Paradoxically, we have a very complex concept, but it translates very easily. All of the five, all of the five dimensions of the heart listed above appear to be active in the four languages. I've studied corpora, textual analysis, interviews, and very much pop songs. The vital organ, the faculty of perceiving, the desiring heart, the generous loving heart, uh, the heart that can offer itself to others, the heart of our intuition that acts as our guide, Many of our, met our conceptual metaphors seem to coincide. Oh, I'm not going really to in this one. Okay, uh, many of the conceptual definitions seem to coincide. Um, metaphors and expressions are renowned for being difficult to translate, but in Europe, at least, we seem to share the same metaphors. The cold heart, the open heart, the heart of stone, even the absence of heart, all contribute to constructing complex narratives about what it means to be human, fully human. Indeed, if we were to take Europe as the world, as which we often do as Eurocentric <laughs> ethnolinguists, uh, we might be inclined to consider that the heart is a universal. Vyazbitska reminds us it is not. But we might be inclined to believe it is. And certainly the major religions uh, and religious thinkers today, such as Nobel, uh, invite us to think of the heart as of this faculty of feeling, this heart as a universal. Many of the people I inter interviewed agree with Nogo, and they share that we all share this capacity for feeling with the heart. So curiously, um, well, curiously they agree with the religious leaders. Uh, even more curious, when I ask them to give their impressions of what the heart is, they usually contradict themselves. So my French students, for example, define the heart, the heart is an organ. And when I say, can you give me some expressions, they say, Ah, le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ignore. The heart has its reasons that the reason doesn't know about. Okay, so they get very examples, they talk of a very different kind of heart. They're at ease within these contradictions, as we probably all are. 
Now this leads us to the complexity of translating heart, and I only have time to briefly list the number of com com complications that I think translators have to watch out for. These are questions that I'm developing in other papers in Warsaw and in, in Australia. Um, and uh, be, please forgive me, I'll put these online at the, on the RAP website, so forgive me if I, I go a bit too brief, uh, a bit too briskly on these. Okay, I'm going to look at um, seven, seven questions. Negation, compounding, the extensions of metaphors, address and especially diminutives, and finally rival synonyms. So negation proves, proves to be not only secondary, but it's really very much a fundamental, a fundamental um, as a dimension of the heart or the concept of the heart. Speakers and writers constantly affirm that we all have a heart, and a heart is a necessary, essential organ, and it's a necessary faculty of feeling, a universal faculty of feeling. But in all my four languages, many of people are charged with being heartless. But heartless doesn't work quite the same way in different languages. They're, when we say they're incapable of feeling that they treat others badly because they appear not to have developed into fully human, hu humane humans, this concept seems to be translatable. But grammatically, it's problematic because we're using suffixes here, and heart goes to heartless. Heart, heartless denotes the negation in English, and herzlos in German will work in the same way. But German and English are very, very flexible in this, and the noun can produce an adjective. They produce a noun, so we go from herz, herzlos, herzlose kind, heart, heartless, heartlessness, and this is diff this is difficult, difficult for two reasons. The first thing that grammatically is a difficulty that we have to deal with here. Secondly, herzlose kind is not the same thing as the absence of the heart. It's the absence of certain dimensions of the heart, and what we have is a retrécissement or a sort of narrowing down. By the time we get to heartlessness, we're only talking about feeling. We're no longer talking about the vital organ. We're not really even talking about desires. A heartless person has desires. But what he does with the objects of his desires is heartless. Okay, so we're, we're dividing the concept up. This we have to be careful with when we're translating. German and English, of course, uh, offer enormous capacity for compounding. And this poses problems for the translator. The translator must find strategies for translating compounds like uh, uh, heartbreaking. Heart stricken, heart sickness in the heart strings, to play on the heart strings. These don't have word for word equivalents uh, in French or in Czech. Herz and Freund translates fairly easily, but not directly into heart warming into English from German. But Herz efficient, refreshing to the heart, this, this is curious. This reminds me, uh, of some of the marvel in my generation, of the Heineken advert. Where Heineken is some beer that reaches the parts of the body that other beers cannot reach. Okay, it's, it's strange. It seems to it doesn't work. And words like Herz stärkend as Mitte, cardiac tonic, or something for strengthening the heart, these forces to resort in English to circumlocations, uh, indirect patterns, or étoffement in English and in French. And of course, in other languages that don't have compounding, this will cause problems. We said the metaphors were the same, yes, but the extensions and the, of shared conceptual metaphors uh, don't coincide. The heart is often stressed to be what? Central and whole. And this is something that's fundamental for the four languages. But the relationship between the parts and the wholes do not appear to, to coincide. So half-hearted exists as a concept in German. We have halbherzig. But not in French, where it translates with, uh, where we translate it as sans enthousiasme, uh, or in Czech. A contre-coeur? A contre-coeur would be different. It's a contre ma volonté. It's not, not a, c'est pas sans engagement. C'est oui, mais pas tellement. Okay, c'est oh. Okay, this is slightly different. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we wouldn't have the, the half-hearted French people, uh, but the, the term doesn't exist. Um, What's interesting for me is that uh, there's, there's a criticism here anyway. The criticism here is, that, of course, when we talk about half-hearted, nobody in any language said, yeah, I'm a kind of half-hearted guy. <laughs> you know, this was said, there are half-hearted people, and there are people that are all heart, whole heart, like me, like my dad told me to be, and that's what I do in the rugby field. See, so um, there's a sort of negation here. Once again, it's going to be a criticism, but it's going to organize the concept differently. 
address and scale, and this takes me back to the, kind of the, the Slavic languages. In some languages, but German in first, strangely, in some languages, hearts, the heart is used as a term of endearment, vastly in Spanish, mi corazón. Hardly a pop song without that in Spanish. Less so in French, it's rare in English, but it can be used. Uh, but a much more fundamental question for me is the use of the diminutive forms, because we'll have Herzchen in German. Uh, we'll have other lots of d diminutives, but Dushenko, moving from Dusha, from the soul, might be one. Polish and Slovak also use the diminutive forms widely uh, as expressions for what? Honey or deer. Um, um, okay. Deer or baby, these would all be translations of uh, uh, Herzchen. Uh, there's an important distinction, however, with the Czech, for example, because Czech has kept the old declination form of the vocative as a mode of address. Dushenka, the little soul, becomes Dushenko. The diminutive form involves complex, complex implications of tenderness, warmth, proximity, and even a little bit of condescension, and these are not easy to master. They're often gendered, uh, they won't be used in the same way by men as by women, and they tend to be used in particular circumstances and certain situations. Diminutives take us back to rapport, the way we feel about others, the way we express our feelings, and these questions are fundamental, of course, for the heart. And for, for language, they're difficult to translate, especially for languages like French and English that are relatively poor in diminutive forms. Very briefly on animals and for men, we're going to be speaking a lot about uh, narratives in the following days. Uh, animals are often set up as straw men. It's a strange idea. But uh, we set up animals as heartless beasts, and we're opposing to them to thinking, feeling men. But at times we uh, attribute, for example, at times we'll attribute the heart to certain animals. Lions, bears, elephants, tigers have hearts, but chickens? Chickens don't have hearts, okay? Chickens and lilies. And here we start setting up. Uh, okay, I'm really not respecting this part of this, sorry. Uh, here we'll get chickens and lilies that will set up parallel narratives uh, in which chickens are living and lilies are living, but animals and flowers are pretty much the same thing, as opposed to lions. Uh, the problem here, of course, is that, you know, as we saw today with Indus, you know, Dan and John's presentation, is that, of course, these narratives are cultural narratives with cultural symbolism for, for, for all of the animals. The animals are stories, these are stories about people and how we understand people and use animals for them. And these translate very diff with great difficulty when we translate our mythology and fables. Um, gender, then. Men can be heartless, women can't. Men can be heartless, which means that they are no longer men. They're inhuman animals, they're bastards, inhuman bastards. But women, uh, women are, no, women can't be heartless because as we see in the corpora, women lose their femininity. They are no longer women if they're heartless. Why? Because woman is supposed to, and this is the rappers, they explain us this. Women are, are educators, they educate men as lovers, as mothers, in the domain of the heart. So how could they refuse to do that? How could you be so heartless? How could you be so heartless? How could you be so heartless? This will be the rapper song. King West, he has millions and millions and millions of fans. And he's telling the story, the story that we like to hear, that women are there to look after us, to love us, and to keep us aware of what love is all about, OK? Um, the final thing then, no, of course, would be rival synonyms, and I think the Russian teacher, although some of you might not have got the French, is suggesting that the French understand things through the vital feeling of the heart, through sentiment, but the Russians <gasps> have a Ruskaya Dusha. Uh, when I asked this question in, uh, in our uh, conference with uh, Karsten a few weeks ago, I said, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And she said that the French don't understand this. What do you think? You're a French woman living in a uh, Russian woman living in France. She said, only Russian women feel that there's only Russian women who understand it so. Okay, so, but she said that in French and she was reluctant to say this. Okay, so all of us believe that the heart is fundamental, um, but if we look at how the, how the heart is faring, the heart is only half, is, it's, it's very half-hearted. 
There's only half as many references to heart as there were at the end of the 19th century. So heart is not going out of, it's continually being a very, very creative, creative uh, element, but it's lost some of its creativity. Um, where? In linguistics, in ethnolinguistics, where we don't talk about the heart much, we talk about uh, cognition and uh, linguistic uh, understanding, uh, we talk about the spirit, the geist, and we think of worldviews and Weltanschauung and Weltansichten. Uh, for the social sciences don't like the word, the heart. They associate it with subjectivity, which of course it is, subjective. Psychology, unfortunately, has followed this trend. Um, in publicity, the heart is widely used, but not in human resources. So the relationship in business where the heart is used. So I went to businesses in France, and I went to Petit Kivi to interview managers of companies, and they all said, well, you can't do business without the heart. You can't have a company without a heart. So even they regarded the heart as fundamental. This is the overriding impression I'm left with. From reading, from research, from corpus analysis, and from my interviews, we cannot ignore the heart. Or if we do, we do so at our peril, because for most of us, the hearts are some, the hearts exist as a personal truth, as a shared experience, as a faculty to be used, but a faculty be, to be cultivated, neglected, or lost. And the choice is ours. Of course, we might, as ethnolinguists, we might, as sociologists, uh, we might prefer something that's more scientific, something less subjective, something easier to get a hold on. But if we rely on thinking and feeling, um, but if we rely on, sorry, if we rely on thinking and if we consider only conceptualization in languages, cognition, if we reduce worldviews to thinking, to reason, to analysis, we leave behind many of the questions, the questions that are so obvious to the people who accepted to express their thoughts and their feelings spontaneously about the heart in my interviews. The heart is therefore, I would argue, a fundamental, necessary paradigm for studying languages, worldviews, and speech communities. Thank you.